we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to this uh, session of the uh, wonderful conference we've been having so far. Um, this is the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center and the Telehealth Alliance of Oregon uh, Conference. So welcome to everybody. Um, I am uh, located here in Utah and we've had quite a day here in Utah. We started off the day with a, uh, an earthquake aftershock. We had an earthquake here in Utah a few weeks ago and we, we continue to have aftershocks. We had another one this morning and then it started to snow um, and rained pretty hard and now the sun shines out. So it's been an interesting day. Um, we wanna make sure and uh, recognize our sponsors our sponsors are uh, Zoom, Western Governors University, Poly, Amwell, Simple Visit, and also JotForm, and two nonprofit uh, sponsors, the Pacific Northwest University of Health Sciences, and also the University of Utah Health uh, Clinical Neurosciences Program. As we start this session, I have a few items uh, I want to cover on the technology. Uh, a few instructions. Audio and video are muted for all participants, but you are welcome to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you just hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, uh, a bar will open up with a Q&A feature. You are welcome to type your questions into that. I'll be monitoring it um, along with the speakers, and we'll make sure those questions get, get answered. We will probably hold off on questions during the presentation and try to answer them at the end. Uh, the presentation slides are posted online already on the nrtrc.org website. If you want to download the slides and follow along. And in the next few days, the uh, re recording will also be posted on the same uh, website for the conference. Our presenters today, uh, we have four presenters, Erica Shearer, uh, clinical psychologist, uh, Jean Kim, who's also a clinical psychologist, uh, both at the VA Puget Sound Seattle division, uh, Marilyn Picarillo, a psychology intern, um, and Sasha Ro Royas at the Telehealth and Rural Health, who is a Telehealth and uh, Rural Outreach Fellow at the VA Puget Sound Seattle Division. So we're uh, really excited for them to be here. Their title of their presentation is Utilization of Telemental Health for Suicide Prevention. So I'm going to uh, close my slides and turn the time over to, um, let's see, uh, Erica, right? Thank you, Matt, for the warm introduction. I will uh, get my slides uh, showing. Okay, looks like they are sharing now. Hopefully you can all see them. We're excited to be presenting for you. So most of us are up in the Seattle area, although I am a virtual psychologist down in Portland where it's just been sunny and beautiful. So I'm sorry to hear about all the <laughs> crazy um, weather and um, all kinds of issues in, in Utah. I'm so glad you could still be here and join us. So uh, we are excited to talk about this um, topic talking about this kind of from a clinical perspective, but also from a research perspective. Let's see if I can advance my slides here. There we go. So we have some learning objectives today. We're going to, first of all, kind of broad strokes, talk about how telemental health can be used to address um, risk. We want to talk about cons clinical considerations for using telemental health to manage suicidal risk. And when we talk about telemental health, we're really talking about, in the VA words, clinical video telehealth. So we're talking about a video component. And then we want to wrap this up by some evidence-based practices for addressing patients that have a suicidal risk. So let's kind of set the stage here. I think I may be preaching to the choir when we're talking about the need for telemental health. 
but this graphic really highlights the shortage of health professionals really throughout the nation. And so to give you some context, this data is from the Health Resources and Services Administration, and it's, it's focused on mental health. They do have other disciplines on the website if you go out and check for yourself, um, but it's mental health shortage areas by county. Um, and you can see that broad strokes, the, the dark is bad here, um, light is good. And just from a cursory view, you can see that there's a lot of counties in the US that have uh, areas of mental health sh shortage. And certainly for our geographical region that we're talking about here, we tend to live in these big states where there's a pocket of a metropolitan area. In Washington and Oregon, we talk about the I-5 corridor where you can see that there is more representation there, but not so much in other areas. Being in Puget Sound, we do focus in on Washington. And I put a couple of little stars here where you can see our biggest areas of Seattle and Tacoma. And really that's where we have professionals and clinicians and staff. And then we've got the whole rest of the state, um, which is not quite so represented. And then just to kind of hit this home, we're going from uh, metro to rural in this uh, graph here. And then uh, it's a little bit hard to see on the axis, but we're also looking at suicides, um, uh, suicide deaths. And we can see that as folks are increasing in rurality, the deaths, the rate of deaths are also increasing. And this is happening through time. So rural areas represent an area of high need, high risk, and low access. So hooray, telemental health expands access to care, which I think is why we are all here. So just some literature review before we delve in a bit deeper. So far, the literature for telemental health, again, this video component um, to it is really promising in that for many uh, mental health problems, it works, which is great for us to hear. There's been case examples uh, demonstrating feasibility for addressing suicide risk. And then kind of the, the take home piece is that traditional care for veteran, or veterans or uh, non-veterans as well in, in terms of managing suicide risk is telephone based. It's typically telephonic care, crisis intervention lines, um, some text services. So if we're thinking about video-based telehealth, Sometimes we're trying to think about does adding video, what does that do? Uh, there's, there tends to be some trepidation on clinicians' part around providing video-based care for suicide risk management. And on the flip side, we can think that adding the video might give so much rich information about the patient's surroundings, their home environment, and that's really what this kind of bottom bullet is about, is maximizing that use and seeing if there's added depth and richness. Um, a challenge with the data so far in the literature review so far is that many clinical trials tend to exclude patients who are high risk or acute. Sorry, I'm wrestling with my headset here. And like I said before, providers uh, tend to grapple with uh, managing high risk patients. And, and that's something that we're hoping today we can talk more about and see you know, what that's about and um, how we can assuage some of these concerns. Bottom line, there are no contradictions to patients being seen or assessed or treated using telemental health. So it's really at the discretion of the provider, the clinic, how these things are set up for, um, for their, uh, them to decide what kind of patients they will and will not see. So I am going to give uh, control over Let's see if I can do this to Marilyn. All right, here we go. Hi, so I'm gonna share um, some results from a quality improvement study that we did here in the VA Puget Sound um, led by Sasha Rojas. Um, and what we wanted to look at, um, given that Erica mentioned that uh, individuals at higher risk um, are often excluded from telemental health studies, we wanted to examine um, to what extent 
telemental health is being implemented among veterans here at RVA um, who are at high risk for suicide. So we conducted a quality improvement study here um, using chart review um, from veterans enrolled in healthcare here in the VA Puget Sound. Um, so we aim to examine the demographic um, and clinical characteristics of veterans receiving either telemental health um, care or in-person services. Um, and so what we did is compared uh, suicide behavior reports, which is basically just um, a documentation of when a veteran uh, makes a suicide attempt or engages in any form of suicidal behavior, um, the provider would complete a suicide behavior report. Um, so what we did is pull um, this data from the chart um, and examine the suicide behavior reports both before and after uh, the veteran's first individual mental health appointment, and then examine those differences as a function of treatment modality. So in other words, um, the telemental health video um, care or in-person appointments. There we go. All right. Um, so this table here just shows some of those demographic and clinical characteristics. Um, the main thing to take away is that overall the sample is primarily uh, male, white, non-Hispanic, uh, non um, service connected, and then served in either the Vietnam or Persian Gulf um, War eras. Um, and the most important piece of information from this table is that there were actually minimal differences between the telemental health and the in-person groups. Um, specifically, you'll see here, as I've highlighted, um, both groups appear to receive a similar dose of treatment, if you will. So around four um, sessions um, was the mean number of appointments. And again, these sessions were delivered either for the telemental health group um, through the clinical video care or in person. Um, and so what our results demonstrated is that uh, veterans who received telemental health were less likely to present um, with a suicide behavior report in the six months prior to their first appointment. However, there were no differences in rates of suicide behaviors or time until a suicide behavior in the 12 months following their first, appoint first appointment. So basically, even though there were some differences between the two groups prior to coming in for their first uh, session, there was no difference and no statistically significant difference in risk um, after that first appointment for the year that they were followed. Um, and in terms of demographic characteristics, age was a significant protective factor for suicide risk. Um, so this data was used to make um, changes uh, to uh, some of the eligibility or clinical indications for engaging in telemental health care here at our local VA. All right. And I'm now going to turn it back um, to Erica to, to continue on with the rest of the presentation. All right, so um, we wanted to provide some recommendations for suicide prevention when using telehealth. Um, and the first step that everyone can take is just familiar, familiarizing yourselves with the existing guidelines for assessing suicide risk and facilitating higher level of care when that is warranted. And so on the right hand side here, you'll see that there are some existing guidelines from various disciplines and also one on specifically assessing and managing suicide risk by the DOD and VA. Um, and as Erica mentioned, uh, none of these guidelines identify a specific circumstance when the, uh, using CBT would always be contraindicated. Um, instead, what these guidelines focus on are considerations you'd want to make, um, which may impact whether you decide that CBT would be clinically appropriate. All 
right. And then in terms of additional steps that you can take even before the first appointment, um, one thing you can do is think about what HIPAA compliant options you have for sending and receiving therapy materials. One that we really like using is sec uh, secure messaging, but you could also do things like screen sharing, um, even having a patient hold up a completed measure to the screen, although sometimes it's a little bit tricky to see. And then of course, using regular snail mail as well. Um, if the patient is located out of the state and you're licensed in that state, you wanna make sure you are familiar with the laws of that state. So. Um, one such as involuntary commitment, duty to notify, and abuse reporting would be particularly relevant for uh, considering suicide risk. And then finally, it's always helpful to be familiar with local resources, hospitals, support staff in the patient's area, and also considering an emergency contact as well. All right, and then hopefully before that first session, um, individuals have also been provided uh, with informed consent, and so that'll set you up really nicely for addressing suicide risk. Um, of course, you still want to review confidentiality at that first appointment and its limits, including in electronic communication as well. And at the very start of that appointment, you wanna verify their current location and contact information, and you usually wanna do this at every visit. Um, and for some people, physical location could even mean things like the mile marker or cross street that they're at with the color, make, model, and license plate of their vehicle. We've seen veterans for telehealth appointments in their parked cars in a relatively private location, and you just wanna make sure that you can document that and um, provide that location to emergency services if it's needed. In that first appointment, you'll also create an agreed upon safety plan. And so you'd want to, again, check availability of 911 in that area and work with the patient to think about um, what sorts of contact numbers and services they have. So what are the local crisis numbers, hospitals, police abuse reporting, um, and then also keep in mind that when you call emergency services like 911 from your phone, that'll go to your local area, but they can dispatch you to your patient's area. Um, and then another thing that you wanna do in terms of planning is discuss in that first session a plan um, for what will happen uh, if there's a service disruption. Like let's say the internet cuts out either on your end or the patient's end, how will you reestablish contact? And a lot of times that's using the phone if the video continues to not be functional. Um, and then like we mentioned on the previous slide, you can also think about whether an emergency contact with a release of information would be helpful for higher risk folks. And for minors, it's always helpful to have a parent or guardian present in the home during that appointment time. Um, and then as part of your informed consent, it's important to uh, make sure that the patient is aware that appropriateness for telehealth requires kind of ongoing assessment. There may be times when higher level of care may be warranted. So for example, if you're seeing that patient um, on an outpatient basis via telehealth, there may be times when residential or inpatient treatment may be a better fit. All right. Um, and then as part of the intake, you'll want to engage in comprehensive suicide risk assessment. Um, and also along with the usual assessment throughout the treatment. And that assessment should really be multidimensional. And so you can of course um, include your routine screening measures for suicide risk, but also use visual cues from the video that you have for example, grooming, mood, the environment that they're in, um, using collateral reports from loved ones, and of course, the patient's verbal report as well. All right, um, so we talked about how kind of clinical appropriateness and expectations should be discussed at the onset of treatment and throughout treatment as well. Um, when you think about who is appropriate for telehealth, especially among those who are higher risk, um, the primary concern is really patient willingness. So at a minimum, the patient should be willing to be open about risk, um, letting you know when they're having suicidal thoughts, the frequency of those thoughts, what kind of thoughts they may be having, 
um, and a willingness to engage in safety planning and means restriction. So if they have a loaded gun in the home, what steps are they willing to take to ensure more safety? Um, they should also be willing to ensure a private location for their appointments and to share the exact location with you um, so that if you do need to call for emergency services, uh, they can actually be located. Um, you also want to use your clinical judgment to determine whether they really can abstain from therapy interfering behaviors like substance use, self-harm, etc. And then kind of continue to, again, evaluate that willingness throughout treatment. All right, and then the ATA also um, advises that clinicians consider uh, a variety of other factors when evaluating patient willingness. So things like cognitive capacity, their history of cooperativeness with providers, um, if they have substance use or substance abuse currently, um, any violence or self-injurious behavior, how close um, their nearest emergency medical facility is located, what support they currently have, um, other co-occurring medical problems, and their general competence around technology and willingness to troubleshoot when problems will arise. All right, and so if you were to have a clinical emergency, we wanted to break it down a little bit um, to talk about the steps that you might take. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is just look back on the agreed upon emergency plan and follow it. Um, and so that includes things like staying connected over video. Um, so when you have that patient and there is a clinical emergency, you wanna still try to stay connected with them uh, just to ensure that plan is followed through. Um, it can be really helpful to involve others in the home, such as that agreed upon emergency contact. Um, and then on the provider end to also utilize support that you might have in your facility. Um, it's always helpful to have a secondary phone or using things like IM um, or something like that so that they can help with that care coordination while you stay connected with the patient over telehealth. And then finally, of course, you wanna coordinate the involvement of, of emergency services by telephone, usually 911. All right, and then in our work um, in telehealth, we've always found that whenever questions arise about risk or appropriateness for telehealth, it's been so helpful to consult with other telehealth providers, especially those on a telehealth team. And um, we've also found it really helpful to seek consultation with suicide prevention if that's available for additional prevention strategies. Then kind of putting it all together now, um, you know, use your training, your good clinical judgment and the plan that you've collaboratively created with the patient. Remember there are no strict rule outs or co contraindications, but an interdisciplinary team that's all trained in telehealth can be really helpful for consulting and also treating high risk patients using a team based, team -based approach. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Sasha. Um, all right, so we're gonna now dive into talking about evidence-based interventions for suicide risk that can be delivered through telemental health. I wanna start first with an intervention that is likely familiar um, that's the suicide safety planning. And when this intervention is done correctly, it can be quite effective. It's been shown to decrease suicidal behavior by up to 50%. So really to maximize suicide safety plans, it's important that it's first individualized to the patient's needs and that it's flexible, uh, meaning that it can be applied in multiple scenarios, uh, even in the face of barriers and that it's feasible uh, and that it can be easily applied during a suicidal crisis. And finally, that it is created in collaboration with a provider and a patient. So this is not effective if it's simply just handed to a patient as a handout to fill out. Um, really, it's effective whenever a provider and a patient take the time 
and the provider can empower the patient to really take ownership and think through not only when to use a plan, but also how to use it. And then finally, after creating a plan, it's really helpful to uh, walk through it, maybe think of scenarios uh, and see if the patient successfully walked through it and ask them how, how do they feel, how confident do they feel in their ability to be able to use it. So um, when I am creating a suicide safety plan, I like to tell patients that really it's a living document that will change uh, either through trial and error or through just um, life circumstances. So it's not only just creating the plan, but also checking in with the patient and seeing, hey, was that plan effective for you? And uh, how can we make it more effective? How should we update it? Or should, how should we update it based on current life changes? Um, so for example, one way that all of our lives have changed is with COVID-19. And so now is a great time to update uh, or work with your patients to update their suicide safety plan. So let's imagine, um, for example, if a patient had distraction techniques listed such as have lunch with a friend or go to the gym for 30 minutes, these will really need to be worked out right now when we consider social distancing practices. And um, importantly, it's important to still have the function of the strategy stay in place, although the details may change. So for lunch with a friend, we know that social connectedness is important. So how can that be done today? Maybe that's a Zoom date with a friend or while you both eat, while they eat lunch at separate places or with a gym to kind of have some of that release. Perhaps you can help the patient think through how exercise can be done in their home. Um, it's also important to attend how warning signs can change and especially in the face of current events. So again, when you're working collaboratively with a patient, just asking them, you know, have you noticed that your warning signs have changed at all? Or have you noticed any new warning signs um, during this time? So creating a suicide safety plan collaboratively is certainly feasible through telemental health. And it's really critical actually. Um, so when we think about feasibility, which we said is really important, we wanna think about how can we promote accessibility since we're not in the room with a patient. So this can be done by one, you can have a fillable safety plan on your end and share screen with the patient so that the individual can see the plan as you both collaboratively create it. Um, they can take a screenshot of that plan or perhaps add it to a mobile app where they have the plan there in their phone. Um, I often like to do it to where I'm sharing the screen and they write their plan on a note card or something small that they can take with them and make it more feasible in a time of need. So once the plan is actually created, you can obviously uh, um, send a copy to them through a secure messaging platform. Um, and you can also send a hard copy through the mail. And this can be really helpful because Oftentimes, it's nice for patients to be able to share their safety plan with a trusted loved one, or maybe have it in different areas um, where different warning signs might present. And finally, you want to keep the safety plan simple, um, as opposed to maybe having a three-page safety plan that is just in a hard-to-follow format. It might be easier to have the patient write their own plan, again, something small like an index card in their own format so that way they can easily follow it. So lethal means safety counseling is another important um, suicide prevention intervention. And we know that acute suicidal crises are brief and they're time limited. So by incorporating mean safety practices, you can really create a barrier that prevents a fatal outcome during this brief time of intense emotional distress. We also know that 90% of people who attempt suicide will survive or, and who survive do not go on to die by suicide later. 
So what that means, if we can help patients by practicing lethal means safety, if we can help them to get through a suicidal crisis, the odds are in their favor that they will not later die by suicide. And finally, um, easy access to lethal means is um, by far the strongest determinant of a suicide outcome, being death by suicide. And there's no reason right now to believe that lethal means safety counseling would be any less effective via telemental health as compared to in person. And at some level, there actually might be an advantage of doing this through telemental health. So for example, when you're doing a lethal means safety counseling, it can be really important or helpful to incorporate a love member or a trusted person in the discussion of lethal means practice or lethal means safety practicing, um, such as offsite storage of firearms. Now with telemental health, you might have this advantage if your patient's at home, perhaps their loved one is in the home and can be incorporated into a session as compared to if it was just you and the patient at home, uh, in your office. Now, when a patient's on board to create a mean safety plan, uh, this is again when video uh, screen share can be really helpful because you can pull up that safety plan on there and walk through what that plan will look like. Now, in person, you might be able to provide a patient with tools such as a gun lock. And again, that's not feasible through telemental health, but you can think creatively of how to make that possible, perhaps mailing a gun lock to that patient's home. Here at the VA, we're lucky to have a fabulous suicide prevention team, which they can actually directly mail these gun locks and other resources directly to a veteran's home. Also at the VA, um, the pharmacists here can send an envelope for safe medication disposal. We also located that the DAE, DEA has a search function to identify um, disposable sites in the community. And we have that listed under some of our resources later on. Finally, I want to end by touching on some suicide-specific psychotherapies uh, that are currently available. Although there is no current research about the delivery of these treatments through telehealth, uh, there is no reason to think they're not effective. And really, I think COVID-19 has forced us to think about how do we keep these treatments going with our patients when we're all forced to now see our patients through telehealth. Um, the first one here on the left is brief cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy for suicide prevention. This is a manualized treatment with the manual um, became, becoming available recent just as 2018. And this treatment has been shown to reduce um, the risk for a future suicide attempt um, by 60% as compared to treatment as usual in a two year period. And it, it, treatment is about 12 sessions long um, with sessions being about one hour long and can be delivered weekly or maybe twice a week. Now, the second treatment here is maybe more familiar, um, dialectical behavior therapy. And this treatment too has been shown to be very effective in reducing the likelihood of future suicidal behavior and also hospitalization as compared to treatment as usual. Unlike BCBT for suicide prevention, DBT is much more time intensive. Um, full DBT uh, requires weekly and uh, individual and group therapy sessions that last for a year. And there's also phone coaching that can happen between sessions. And finally, another treatment option is CAMS, um, which is a framework to help providers assess suicide risk and work with their clients to develop a collaborative treatment plan to manage different risk factors specific to their client's own suicide risk. I'm not gonna go into more detail about these treatments, but there are certainly these books that are available and also workshops offered to really help you get hit the ground running with these treatments. 
So as I mentioned, there's no research on the delivery um, of these treatments. However, there are no contradictions that we think of using these treatments through telemental health. And just like the delivery of other evidence-based treatments via, via telemental health, uh, making the material accessible is really key. And this can be done by creating fillable form versions of different homework sheets or the self-report inventories that you wanna use during treatment. And those forms can also be sent um, to your patient through a secure messaging platform, as long as maybe, along with other maybe forms that you wanna send, such as helpful psychoeducation sheets. And again, if that's not available, you can also consider mailing these forms to your patient ahead of time. And finally, um, to promote accessibility, when you are presenting new material, that share, screen share function can be really helpful to presenting and practicing new material. All right, so I'm just gonna end now with um, pointing your direction to some resources that we have found. So there's a lot of resources about lethal means safety, counseling, and also places where you can dispose of um, medications uh, or think of where you can store firearms. In addition to that, there, here's some other resources related to safety planning and risk management. And lastly, the Rocky Mountain My VA, their MIREC has this great uh, resource, which is the Suicide Risk Management Consultation Program, which can also be very helpful as you think through managing suicide risk um, through telemental health. And we just want to end by saying thank you very much for listening, and we're more than happy to take any questions at this time. You're muted, Matt. It looks like we don't have any questions in the Q&A right now. So Sasha, I actually, uh, one question just came in. Will the slides with the resources be published? This, the slides are actually already on the NRTRC website. Um, if there's any other links or resources that the presenters want to send to us, we can get those posted there as well. And uh, we can, we also have a couple of case examples if folks wanted to kind of hear or, um, more about how this has gone. Um, and then, oh, it looks like there's some questions coming in now. Yeah, there are. So the first question says, any insights to share from experiences with suicide behavior online? So I'm not quite sure. I'm wondering if this is referring to experiences with patients who express acute suicidality via telemental health. Um, and we can kind of talk through a couple of those examples. If that's not correct, then please type in the question um, and, and we can redirect. Um, let's see here. I think I have control over the slides here. So we have a couple of case examples um, and we just wanted to highlight a couple of these. And then the second case example might um, also pertain to that hygiene question, because you're right, over telemental health, you don't have some of the more kind of sensory cues that you might have with someone coming into um, your office in person. So the first case example uh, that I wanted to share, am I sharing my screen still? No, not yet. <laughs> I was like, hey, this looks kind of different. No wonder. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Okay. There we go. So this is a, a patient who 
uh, he was actually with uh, one of my patients who expressed suicidality and um, it was through our assessment um, that we really deemed that he was at imminent risk um, and had and his level would just warranted a higher level of care than outpatient mental health, which is what we were providing. Uh, he was a home, he, he was at home, he was alone, um, and just didn't feel like he could wait until a support person could come to um, assist with him going into a hospital. And so we spoke collaboratively and talked about our plan that we had made um, and really kind of spoke candidly around would it be better for me to call emergency medical services? Would the veteran want to call? And uh, he was pretty confident in making the call himself and I stayed on the telehealth appointment with him while he used his cell phone to call 911 and engage emergency services. And it actually facilitated this warm handoff with EMS uh, where I could say, yep, hi, you know, and kind of be there to support him while he took the actions himself. Um, so that was one example, and there's a lot more written in the slides that you can peruse on your own. Um, and here's kind of where we talked about what we did. And then another example that we put in here was a patient who, um, one of the primary concerns was substance use and abuse. So I think this one might be relevant to the hygiene piece because Absolutely, you can't, um, you won't get some of those cues, but what's really interesting with hygiene over telehealth is you get others too. You can see what their surroundings look like at home. Um, we see a lot of hoarding and things like that and just changes in the living environment. Um, you might even see things like alcohol in the, in the background or um, medications or other things like that. So it really is a pro kind of con piece and I've gotten pretty used to how my patient looks. So when they show up kind of disheveled, I can see that something is up and something's going on. With a patient with substance use though, that's one where you certainly don't smell alcohol on the breath. Um, and this was a patient who had used for so long that uh, he was pretty adept at masking. He also wasn't really very open about how much he was drinking. And, and there were some uh, challenges here. Um, he couldn't, uh, he had a DUI, so he couldn't drive in person to a clinic anyway, and having a support person drive him in for in-person appointments wasn't feasible. And so it was a bit of a challenging situation where I think we felt on the telehealth team, um, like there weren't other real resources for him aside from perhaps a residential treatment facility or something like that. So some of our work was kind of working on his willingness to do that. So this would be an example where perhaps the patient really wasn't as willing as we would like him to be around being open around risk, um, being willing to engage in uh, reducing substance use, reducing harm, um, and there were some real challenges there. He did end up going to a residential treatment facility for uh, alcohol use, and then uh, it was, oh, here we go, <laughs> it was after discharge um, and planning that we were able to work with the addictions treatment clinic around having both of us see him so that he was having more frequent engagements with mental health. So he had a substance use provider that could really drill down on the alcohol use and I could focus more on PTSD and we were communicating more with each other. Uh, there are things like um, breathalyzers and Bluetooth capable breathalyzers too that could be used. Um, you could talk about local facilities and doing UAs. So that would be some pieces I would add. Certainly don't want to speak for the whole panel though, if others have other um, suggestions. I noticed um, Laura there wrote uh, like managing acute risk. And again, I think just kind of highlighting that it'd be the same as you would do in person. So we're involving now higher levels of care. Um, there's no reason that that can't be done through telemental health.
since we have just a few more minutes, there, there's one other question in the queue that maybe we can get to. It says, I've heard from mental health clinicians that they are concerned about not being able to smell clients. In terms of hygiene, how do you navigate that? I think Eric had mentioned about how there might be other visual cues, right? Seeing um, patients, uh, how they present in person. I think someone might have just said something. Um, but yeah, you're right. We don't have that smell function. That will be one limit. And one question was, do you find issues with people feeling less connection with telehealth? Um, I personally haven't seen that with any veterans I've worked with. Um, they're usually just so pleased to be able to have access to treatment. Um, and it, it really just works as well as it does in person. Many times too with suicide specific treatment, uh, it, it really the environment of being at home allows them to work through their safety plan as they would if they were alone. So there's a lot of great benefits really to working with a patient at home. Yeah, and just one other piece, uh, there's some research out there um, in line with this and also anecdotally, some patients actually feel that they can disclose more because there's a little bit of separation and they're in their home environment, particularly among the veteran population with women veterans or transgender veterans, we see a little bit of a higher proportion over telehealth because that hospital setting may not feel as safe and comfortable. And then just anecdotally in my um, chronic pain group, folks have talked about that they can feel much more at ease at home and actually kind of disclose a bit more because they don't have people right in the room with them. So it's a kind of a paradoxical effect that can happen with rapport. Um, so, so far, similar to Sasha, I've, I've had kind of the opposite of experience. Um, adding some anecdotal evidence as well, now that most all of our care here at the VA has switched over to telehealth um, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, it's been interesting to watch how group um, therapy um, has adapted to the telehealth modality. Um, so we're offering um, group therapy via um, video um, telehealth, but then also through phone. And so um, what I've noticed um, as a provider here is that we're still able to get a good um, discussion going and a good connection. It just requires a bit more um, uh, like consciousness upfront, you know, like saving some extra time to troubleshoot folks who are having issues with video or with phones. But after that, it's, it's pretty smooth sailing, which is, um, again, perhaps a bit paradoxical, but, but really cool to see. Well, we've got some comments saying thank you. That was a fantastic panel, very informative and helpful. Um, so thank you all so much uh, for sharing your expertise with us today. And with this audience, we had, I believe, over 70 attendees. So well attended. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure.